on emerging tech policy. Our dream at the Lawyers Hub is to have open access to law. We envision a continent where there is access to justice through leveraging technology and with a crowd of enlightened lawyers. We see a continent that also protects its own through better tech policies, that emerging technologies through its regulation will offer better value and consumer protection for the people within Kenya and within the African continent. We envision that we will convene policy makers, regulators, as well as lawyers who are more enlightened on emerging technologies and with better digital skills. And we invite you to be a part of this great vision for Kenya and for Africa. Okay, wow. Welcome to yet another Policy Monday here at the Lawyers Hub. That's a very lovely documentary about the Lawyers Hub. Um, this is a very lovely afternoon, and I would uh, really like uh, to welcome you all um, to this Policy Monday. Um, it's uh, the 13th of Monday, 2023. And today we are discussing a very hot topic that has been going on in 2023. And it started also in 2022 uh, about digital tax. Um, the digital uh, era, the tech era has really been rampant at this time. And um, everything that is so disruptive has to have that other end where the government has to get revenue out of it. And um, uh, I'd really want to encourage you to talk uh, in this conversation and tell us where you're watching us, uh, where you're watching us from, and uh, also um, where you are at this moment. Um, uh, welcome. Uh, here also we have uh, my colleague Dixon. Um, he'll be taking us through an overview of what digital tax is and its impact to the economy, uh, to the digital economy. And we also have a marvelous uh, uh, panelist uh, that we just uh, finished uh, mic check just uh, five minutes ago, and they're very psyched to have this conversation. Um, so I won't uh, waste a lot of time in introducing. I'd uh, just keep tabs on uh, uh, an article I read today on the Daily Nation. Um, in this article was just an, uh, a highlight by the committee, uh, National Assembly Committee on uh, Communication, Information and, Innov Innov uh, and Innovation. They are actually talking about how they need to uh, remove this digital tax for the youth because they want to keep on making a lot of uh, digital community innovation hubs. Currently we are at 262 innovation hubs and they want to reach 1450 uh, innovation hubs in the next, I think, three years. And um, uh, they're feeling like this digital tax is punitive uh, to the youth. But I want to hear your thoughts about this topic and all um, uh, the, talk, the talk about digital tax. Um, so uh, without further ado, um, I'd also want to encourage you to tag us uh, with your opinions on our social media platforms. Uh, you can find us at Facebook, uh, Lawyers Hub Kenya, Twitter, Lawyers Hub Kenya, LinkedIn at Lawyers Hub, and we are also on Instagram at Lawyers Hub Kenya. Feel free to ask any questions and the question and answer tab there, make it your space. Uh, we have two rules in this discussion, as I'll put it very loudly. First, um, there's no question that can't be asked. And two, let's learn and have fun. So um, let me introduce Dixon Ugugu. He's a lawyer and a policy and research assistant here at the Lawyers Hub. He's going to just give us an overview uh, on what digital tax is and its impact to the digital economy. Dixon, I'll take you through this uh, discussion, but start us off. Okay, yeah. Yeah, uh, before I start, uh, you can allow sailors to introduce the panelists. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Know that, uh, um, in the house with us. The panelists in the house today, I'm sure they are all in. Um, first of all, we have Ben Roberts. He's the uh, group uh, chief uh, innovation officer at uh, Liquid Telecoms. Um, we also have uh, Reni, uh, Reni Omondi. Uh, Reni, hi. Yes, um, yes, we also have Karen. Uh, Karen is, works at the KRA. 
So um, we just wanted to just introduce you so that the audience knows that you're present in this discussion. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And without further ado, I want to start us off um, with Dixon, who can start uh, the presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, thank you, Silas. Uh, that's a very, very wonderful introduction of uh, digital tax and uh, digital economy in, uh, in Africa and, in the, and Kenya to be specific. So uh, our topic today is digital tax and its impact on the digital economy. So uh, I would love to start us with uh, what exactly is digital economy. Uh, it's basically my, my, my point and my idea is that digital economy is uh, an ecosystem that uh, allows activities that use electro electronic communication and digital technologies to provide goods and services. Basically, this is uh, the use of technology to do business and do services online. So uh, these two, uh, this digital economy has uh, different uh, building blocks. And one of them is uh, the internet. It cannot work without the internet, which actually enables a lot of firms to, alert, to offer and also consumers to seek goods and services online. It also has electronic communication, which actually includes email, your WhatsApp, uh, Twitter, social media that uh, help, helps us in uh, enables affordable uh, communication across the world. We also have digital autom automation, which actually is where uh, companies, most of our companies have uh, computers that power, uh, that make decisions on output prices and how to reach customers and consumers. We also have digital payments, like most of you, I'm, I'm sure you have your M-Pesa services, you also have your uh, various uh, uh, Pesa link, cash, cashless payments, mobile app, uh, payment services from Cooperative Bank, KCB, those banks that have mobile banks in various uh, areas. We also have social media platforms like WhatsApp. So these particular building blocks are actually help in the... Uh, uh, transforming digital economy in Kenya and in Africa and in the world to be at large. So uh, this particular block cannot work, uh, digital economy cannot work without this particular uh, four or five uh, blocks of, uh, that builds on digital economy. So uh, as you can see all of the pictures on your screens, uh, I have actually given you a very, sne a very sn small snapshot of how we have come from the far we have come actually as a, as a nation, as a continent, as you can see, and, and your, the first slide is uh, better said uh, before, 19, the, during the 18, 1800s, 1900s, early 1900s, we used to have uh, better said. Then we have, uh, then we used to have then uh, going to the shop to buy, to buy uh, stuff. And then uh, with those photos, if uh, Ken can uh, allow me to see the photos again, uh, you can see. Uh, going to the shop, then we can see uh, do, uh, now the digital economy coming out with you, Mia, Kelly Mall helping us in uh, purchasing goods and services. Now we go to the traditional, now we have to, uh, looking at the slides, you can see a table form of uh, the difference between technological economy and digital economy, where in traditional we have factories, high, high street shops, newspapers, all word of mouth for advertisements, banks and cash points. Physically, that's why you go to the shop. But then in digital economy, you have data centers. You also have a computer, cloud computing, internet web. You have no physicality. So uh, basically, that's the difference uh, between those two ecosystems. Now, uh, let me take you to the forms of digital economy. Uh, we have e-commerce, one of the forms of digital economy, which involves buying and selling of goods and services over the internet. We also have online advertising. You advertising. also have digital payments, like I've just mentioned in PESA, I'm sure if you, PESA link. We also have digital content creation and distribution. We also have crowdfunding, which I can explain is an online platform to raise funds for projects or venture. We also have a telecommuting, which involves use of digital technologies to work remotely. That's working from home. Most of the companies actually have resulted to people working from home. We also have sharing economy. We also have digital education, where most of us actually do our masters online. Uh, some of you guys have joined our, uh, our data protection uh, training online. It's one of the forms of digital economy that 
is actually technology has helped us with. So uh, then where, how do we tax this particular economy? Because I've just shown you the, the chain of digital economy and what it contains. But then how does the government benefit from this particular ecosystem to raise more funds for its projects and, uh, and developments? So basically, uh, traditionally, uh, we used to, the government used to tax uh, physical goods and services. They are played at the point of sale, such as at physical stores or markets. They also uh, used uh, to clear understand. They also used to have clear understanding of the economic activities and clear draft, identify and track uh, taxable transactions. But then, in the digital economy, you can actually see that uh, the digital goods and services uh, may also be imposed on income income and by digital businesses and transactions that occur electronically. We also have. Uh, Taxation is often uh, remotely uh, across borders and through online transactions. We also have uh, tax authorities and other, other difficulties in tracking and monitoring transactions. Like KRA has a lot of difficulties, I presume, in tracking and monitoring transactions that happen on a daily basis, even hourly basis, in this internet and in our mobile platforms. So. Uh, Taxation in digital economy in Kenya is actually governed uh, by these uh, three tax uh, initiatives that I've just shown you on your screen. It's value added tax, which is charged on digital goods and services that are consumed in Kenya at a rate of 16%, which is actually required to remit, you are, you are actually required to remit the VAT to the Kenyan Revenue Authority on a monthly basis. We also have income tax, which is imposed on tax on income from any source accrued or they lived in Kenya. Now, then we have what we call a uh, digital service tax. Where these are the three actually main uh, tax incentives that you have Kenya, that Kenya has that taxes the uh, digital economy. So that's value added tax, income tax, and then digital service tax. Okay, um, we've just known about the digital economy in Kenya. So just give, take us deeper. Tell us what is digital service tax? Uh, okay, thank you for the question, Elas. I can actually give you a very uh, short uh, snapshot of what this service tax is. This actually tax was introduced in 2020 through a fin Finance Act 2020 as part of the government's efforts to raise uh, funds for the digital economy. Uh, it actually apply applies to both residents and residents uh, in Kenya. And it's payable on income derived in Kenya. For example, if you are a company that uh, actually gets your income in Kenya using the Kenya consumers, you actually have to pay the tax. The rate of this particular tax is 1.5% of the gross tax transactional value, and it's actually excessive of VAT. Uh, the service actually provides uh, requests to file the, the, the returns and pay tax uh, due on or before the 20th. Uh, day of the month. Uh, we also have, uh, actually, that's a very small uh, review, but I'm sure the panelists from the KRA will give us a very strong highlight on that particular aspect of digital service tax of 2020. Uh, as I finish, uh, let me just give you a few challenges that KRA faces in, uh, in, in getting the tax from digital tax. Uh, because most of these things, uh, I'm sure the panelists will talk about them, but we can just give the, our, our, our personal participants a very small snapshot. You can see the challenges carry faces in uh, having this particular digital taxes uh, in the economy. Also, how uh, we can see lack of physical presence because most of these companies work remotely. They are not Kenyan companies, most of them. There's a lack of physicality in appearance in Kenya, making it very, very difficult for carry to identify and tax them. We also have difficulty in, in tracking transactions because I've just mentioned people transact on a daily basis uh, online. Actually, like today, I've just used my personal transaction like four times. So I'm sure I can not be able to, to manage such particular transactions. It's also cross-border transactions. We can see people uh, having sending money to the US, to, the, to Tanzania, Uganda, across the, the continent. It's very difficult for also Kiare to uh, have a track of those particular transactions. This is a lack of awareness, understanding, because most of us uh, don't understand how this particular tax is taxed online. And I'm sure our panelists from Kerry will give a very good uh, awareness on this particular aspect. We have difficulty in determining the value of services and also lack of clear definitions of what exactly digital tax entails. So uh, <clears throat> to, to give a solution to these particular challenges, <clears throat> my apologies, uh, 
we have uh, uh, we can actually uh, help each other in doing awareness <clears throat> like we have today uh, this particular uh, uh, event the awareness creation enabling tax uh, administration and a lot of uh, resolutions we have in this particular aspect so I, after this snapshot, I just hope that our panelists and the participants will give a very clear understanding of the topic so that we can get a, a wide a understanding of what digital tax entails and uh, we can actually know what actually it, it contains. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you so much, Dixon. Um, you've actually just given us a deeper overview of what digital tax is. You've taken us uh, to what digital service tax is and um, how we've started off um, uh, from our traditional avenues to right now. And I'd want to now take us to our panelists directly. And I want to start off with Rene, um, just to give a small <laughs> introduction of uh, Rene. Um, uh, Rene is a partner at Oraro and Company Advocates uh, Dispute Resolution Practice. Um, Rene brings a wealth of uh, litigation experience uh, built over the last 24 years. Uh, with a strong focus on tax litigation. She has worked in uh, various uh, professional service uh, firms, largely comprised of law firms and uh, one audit firm, adding to her rich experience, which has seen her act for clients in notable matters such as representing constructions, real estate, energy supply, telecommunication, manufacturing, and not non-for-profit organization just to mention but a few. Um, additionally, Rene has served uh, as a board member in various uh, reputable institutions such as Tax Appeal Tribunal, uh, Auctioneers Licensing Board, and the Tobacco Control Board. Uh, she has also served as the Vice President of the, as, of the Law Society of Kenya. And Rene also holds a various uh, academic uh, uh, and professional certificates, including being a notary public, a certified public secretary, and a commissioner of oaths. With all that introduction, Rene, um, I know you are happy to join us kindly. Uh, now you can speak to us and tell us more on digital tax. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Silas, for those kind words, and it's a pleasure to be here today with all of you to discuss this interesting subject of uh, digital service tax, a tax that was introduced uh, by law in the Amendment Act in 2020. At that time, it was intended to apply to the residents and non-residents. In uh, June, July of last year, by the Finance Act 2022, an amendment was effected to the same act, that is the section 12E, which now specifically provided that it applied to non-residents without a presence in Kenya. Uh, but what I find most interesting is that whereas that section was amended, the regulation for to the same act or to the same section has not been amended. In fact, uh, it's something that I'm doing research on. Maybe I might have missed the amendment to the regulation because the regulation still re uh, refers to the resident and non-residents. Uh, the reason why the residents are, were excluded is because if they have their resident and if you're a non-resident with presence in Kenya, then uh, you're still supposed to file your returns on income tax. So there's no need of subjecting this particular entities to digital service tax because at the end of the day, the revenue authority would still be able to uh, collect taxes through the income tax. Uh, the most interesting thing I find about digital uh, tax and the challenges that uh, we've been taken through, it is proving to be a bit difficult and I still I would like to hear from Karen how they are going about it uh, to collect the taxes. Uh, the various systems that they have in place, because yes, whereas it enhances accountability and transparency, there are still those who are still intent on avoiding tax or evading tax, uh, so to speak. As we see that uh, post COVID majority of the businesses have moved their operations online. And uh, this is now becoming more of a challenge. There's no physical presence or stores that uh, the revenue authority can walk into. As at now, I have not encountered any assessment on digital service tax. I know it will come in due time uh, as to those who have not complied. So that is my, my short overview on digital service tax and uh, why it is necessary for the economy. We all need to contribute 
to this great nation. We can't leave it to just a, a handful of uh, of uh, users or taxpayers or uh, beneficiaries. As long as you're making income from any platform, you should be accountable and responsible for remitting taxes. Uh, into the topic too. Um, I'd also want to just have an overview uh, uh, with Ben Roberts. Um, uh, ben Roberts, are you there? I am here. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, you have been the Group Chief Technology and Innovation Officer at Liquid Telecoms. And um, I know you have um, some insight about uh, what digital tax is and how it's really impacting our economy right now. So take us through uh, your view um, as of this topic right now. Okay. Um, let, me, let me start off by... Um, referring to uh, policy. Um, so the policy that is published by the Ministry of ICT in the last uh, government was the 2019 ICT policy. Uh, in the policy, it states that the government will review the taxation regime to better align the requirements of affordable computing, broadband access, financial inclusion, and online work. Uh, it also says incentives, that it will create incentives to push or pull the private sector in certain directions using taxation, challenges and investment of public funds in R&D, internal and foreign demand creation and other mechanisms. That's the policy. Um, that's the opposite of what has actually happened when it comes to a tax law and tax um, regulation. Um, you mentioned VAT and income tax, digital service tax. You, you forgot to mention uh, excise duty, um, where we'll also find that uh, uh, certain products in the IC and the big products in the, in the space of ICT are subject to um, a lot of excise duty. So on your broadband bill you get from any service provider, you have 20% excise duty on your broadband bill and then back on top of that. The 39.2% of your broadband bill is, um, is taxed. Um, added to that, you know, it's not a tax, uh, but on those types of services we, uh, we regulate it under the TIC Act and there's also a 0.5% levy for the universal service fund levy. So that, that is also uh, put on sales of broadband. So you have 0.5 plus 39.2 uh, as being the tax on your broadband bill. So it's coming to 40%. Right? Um, I'll also mention that on you have similar excise taxes and import duties as well on the import of ICT devices. So the majority of what you spend in, in, uh, as an ICT user is on your broadband connectivity and your devices that you're using. So we're seeing with the a litany of taxes from import duty, VAT, uh, and uh, excise duty, and then I RDL and IDF all being compounded on top of each other on imported gadgets. Uh, that's about 60% going on to the cost of your gadget. And yes, uh, to, to go back to your earlier point, it is punitive on the youth, right? Um, when I talk to young people who are starting out, uh, either um, starting their businesses or wanting to get an online job or, or, or just graduated and everything else, they want to get into doing stuff online, um, the thing they are, are most looking for is a laptop computer. This is uh, becoming prohibitively expensive. I don't, uh, you know, I, I tend to buy things abroad when I travel. Uh, and recently I came into Kenya at Christmas uh, with an iPhone and an iPad. They were presents for my family. And uh, I got caught uh, at uh, Jeremy Kenyatta. I hadn't taken them out of the boxes. Uh, and I got, I got done for 18,000 shillings. Um, this is an excessive amount of tax. I'd already paid VAT in the country of origin as well, so it was particularly painful. Uh, I didn't get them duty free. So these taxes are, are, are even bigger than the DST. Um, I will just also say about the DST, um, you know, the assumption, um, the assumption for DST is that it's for non-resident companies who may, be, may not be paying income tax um, in, in this country. Uh, so it's being levied on the service, digital services they sell. This is a unilateral move that Kenya has made, although there's lots of discussions being made uh, and the OECD tax resolution uh, regulations. Kenya decided to go on its own, make this unilateral decision around the service tax. And it takes the assumption that whichever company that is making income in Kenya is making a profit. Um, now, you know, that is to say, it is actually just a, uh, it's coming as a, rather than being, you know, a share of income tax, it is derived from profit. Maybe. This is just being a 1.5% levy on 
whatever digital services you sell. So for loss-making companies, if a company is not making a profit for the digital services that it's selling in uh, Kenya, um, then it would be paying a tax um, where it's not making a profit. I don't know if uh, Netflix is making profit now, but I know Netflix has been making losses for years and years and years, yet it will still be paying 1.5% tax of the uh, non-profit making services that it's selling in Kenya. And the reality is that this is just being treated as another excise tax and the cost is being passed on to Kenya. So it's not really a levy on these foreign companies to get a share of their profits. It's actually just another tax on Kenya being added onto the sales price. So we're seeing the sales price of digital services being ramped up by excise duty and, and, and VST and other things, and then VAT on the top. Um, so really, I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that we are, um, we're already having the industry is, being, um, is, is paying income tax and VAT. There's no problem with that. Um, but we have a litany of other taxes on the gadgets, on the broadband, on the digital services, which is overtaxing the economy. This is at a, um, the digital economy, it's overtaxing it's the economy and it's being punitive ultimately on the year. So I very much support what the Parliamentary Committee and ICT is saying. I think it's time to have a conversation about these punitive taxes, about, about things that are not accelerating the digital economy, but holding it back. Um, so I, I, I do agree that all Kenyans, all people who are doing business in Kenya must pay their fair share of taxes, but this is not the, the way to overtax every single thing in the digital economy. Okay. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, you've actually gone deeper into policy and actually introduced excess duty, um, which we did not really mention. And actually, um, just taking us through your experience uh, through the borders. So um, we'll actually just go through and um, uh, uh, reach on to uh, Karen, Karen Agengo, if I'm saying the name right. Um, she's working at KRA, and um, uh, I'm sure she can now give us um, her insights from where it all really happened. So uh, Karen, you can introduce yourself and uh, actually tell us more. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Karen Agengo, and uh, I work with uh, KRA. I'm currently a manager at KRA. And uh, what I can say is uh, about digital tax, uh, why was it introduced? Yeah, uh, this tax was introduced to address the changing business models. You find that uh, before the traditional way of doing business where somebody had to physically, you know, travel to, to buy goods and services has, has currently changed. And uh, now there are new ways be, uh, of doing business and you find that we can have cross-border trading uh, uh, with uh, various parties all over the world. So digital service tax was introduced to address uh, these emerging uh, changing business models that we are currently uh, experiencing. Uh, we also have another reason, uh, which is to expand the tax base. Uh, you realize that uh, as, uh, as the economy grows, uh, the country also needs revenue to be able to run uh, various uh, sectors of the economy and provide services to the citizens. So expanding the tax base uh, is one of the reasons why digital service tax was introduced so that everybody can come on board and just contribute to uh, paying taxes, just like uh, the traditional ways of doing business, uh, business people have always been uh, paying taxes. Uh, I can say that digital ta service tax was also introduced to ensure equity uh, fairness, uh, neutrality in taxation uh, between the traditional methods of doing business and, and the current uh, digital way of doing business uh, covering cross-border transactions where somebody does not have to be physically present in Kenya, uh, but they can also contribute to the economy by paying uh, uh, some taxes. So that's basically why, uh, why we have the digital service uh, tax. And uh, what I can say is that this kind of tax is more of bringing regulation, uh, regulation in the sense that it is important uh, to know the people who are transacting within your economy, whether they are operating digitally or they are 
operating physically. So we have had the presence of uh, multinationals operating in Kenya and just to regulate their presence, there is need to have such kind of attacks so that uh, then uh, we are aware of, of, of the players in the economy. So uh, I can say that is more of the reason why digital tax is, uh, is currently being implemented in Kenya. Okay, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Karen. And before <laughs> I want to come back to you, I've just seen our CEO here at last, uh, Linda. Uh, I don't know if you're still in the call, you can just say hi. Um, uh, Karen, I'd, 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 <laughs> I'd really want to still get back to you um, and just to just have a question on you in terms of the various challenges people are going through uh, in terms of the uh, cross-border trades and the other challenges that people are passing through uh, with this digital tax. What can you give us the, uh, as the, 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 the resolutions on your side on how we can really tackle these challenges? Oh, the challenges on the side of uh, business people or the challenges, the challenges in, in terms of the government? The challenges in the side of the business people. Okay, I think currently the business people that are, uh, uh, are trading online, uh, basically they have a, a facilitation where if somebody is not present in Kenya, they are required under the tax law to appoint an agent. So we call them tax representatives who are based in Kenya. So first to pay the digital service tax, uh, KRA has put in place uh, a system where the, the digital service provider that is mostly uh, somebody who is not based in Kenya appoints a local representative. And these are the people who will pay tax on their behalf. So these are people who are uh, experts in the tax field and they are uh, vetted by KRA before they are given the, uh, you know, the, the opportunity to act on behalf of this, uh, this uh, multinationals. So that is one of the reasons, uh, sorry, one of the areas of uh, how to address the challenges. And uh, currently I can say this tax really doesn't contribute so much to our economy, but uh, much of it is to facilitate penetration of business uh, online so that we expand our economy. You can, you'll realize that this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, business way of doing things is to create more jobs. You find that uh, currently like when Uber came to Kenya, we have more opportunities for drivers. And uh, so the government is facilitating just registration of such kind of businesses to facilitate uh, other sectors in the economy to, with a view of growing the economy in future. So we are creating jobs for those who do not have jobs, who are actually participating in this kind of digital uh, space. Uh, we believe that with that kind of uh, challenge of addressing unemployment, then we will have uh, higher revenues in the future for the government to be able to provide services to, to the citizens. And also uh, by allowing them to register uh, through the various channels that the government have, uh, then we expect that in the future, the, even the uh, GDP will grow and uh, that is when you will start to realize real taxes coming in from uh, the digital space. So the government is facilitating in the way that if they want to register physical uh, offices, the government is available uh, to register and also to facilitate them through the tax, uh, tax uh, representatives. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. You've actually given us even the benefits of really <laughs> paying the digital tax. Um, I can see some hands up, but before um, uh, we get to you, I introduce our CEO here at the lawyer sub, um, Linda. Linda, you are, you are traveling. I'm actually surprised you're on call. Um, thank you. You can introduce <laughs> yourself and take us through also on this discussion. 
Okay, um, thank you very much. My name is Linda Bonio, and um, this topic is very emotive for me. So I, <laughs> I just have to be part of this conversation. Um, I, I want to make a few comments, and this is to, as we speak about it, it's, it's not about personalities, but really about the officers and the people that, um, that work in this area. So I'm gonna speak as a business owner, a Kenyan, somebody who's in the tech space, a parent, really in every single way. So I joined the conversation by Ben on um, being, being stopped at the airport with gadgets. I had some gadgets in December and I got stopped at the airport and they asked me to pay tax. And that's when I read up a bit again and realized my God, for an iPhone, I need to pay about 55% um, in tax which is crazy because, um, you know, we've, we've seen all these things, you know, uh, we've seen all this, uh, all these progressions on tax happening, but I think it gets to a point where we must ask ourselves the question that what's the effect of this tax on the economy? Um, so this is what happened. Um, when you realize that you can't get an iPhone, that an iPhone is more expensive in Africa than it is in, in the US or in Europe, you begin to start thinking about moving to Europe and moving to the US. If you start thinking about the fact that it's more expensive to date in Kenya, if you're on a dating app, you start thinking, I should actually date in the US or in Europe because you're paying 16% um, to use your Tinder account, your Hinge account, whatever it is. If you realize that you're paying more for Zoom and you're paying 16% more, because that has happened to us as well as the lawyers have this year, we paid 16% more compared to startups in Europe we begin to ask ourselves that question that really is Kenya the only country that startups can exist in? And we are not the only startups that are thinking that way. This last week, um, we had Silicon Valley Bank go down and startups around the world have felt the ripple effect. We've seen in the UK where HSBC has come in to buy the, the bank so that it doesn't go under. And we've seen over 80 African startups, according to Tech Cabal, are affected by what's happening in Silicon Valley. And so what we're trying, what we're doing as African governments without noticing it is we continue to push our startups away to other countries because we think we're taxing big tech, but big tech is passing on that tax to us. It's, ta it's passing that tax to the general public. And what happens then is you lose your best minds and you lose them to, um, to other places. So I'll give an example. The startups that have indicated, and we have a report on this, we, I think we shared it a few weeks ago together with Mozilla, on why government policies are actually driving African startups to Silicon Valley. And one of the things that startups now prefer to do is to set up in Delaware to get capital from Silicon Valley and then to come back to Africa as American companies because we are treating American companies better than we're treating our own startups. And this thing is going to show itself like, a, like it has reared its head in, um, you know, like it has reared its head in Nigeria. You can see that Nigerian companies, um, Nigerians will make money, but they stay in London. Um, and so all the money that they could have made for their country is actually being spent in London. They're raising money in Silicon Valley. So the country does not ideally benefit. And so I think I just wanna say this, that we need to examine the incentives that we are giving to startups in this country, to digital businesses. And we also need to take cognizance of the fact that we are different places. There are countries that are actually not taxing digital businesses yet. Um, and I think there's been a, a fallacy for a long time um, that people are not paying tax. People are paying tax, they're paying for fuel levy, they're paying different kinds of taxes. And so even as we talk about tax, it's not that people want to evade tax, they want to pay for service. But I think that there needs to be um, a really keen um, understanding of what these businesses look like, what their business model is, um, because the more we tax them, the more they will um, escape. They will not use Zoom. People will prefer that they, they, they talk to their friend one-on-one, -on -one, give them the money that they should give them, pay them the debt, and then they don't send it on platforms. What that means is this. People will say to stop taking Ubers. You know, because if I take an Uber or I take um, a Lyft or whatever it is that I'm taking um, or Bolt, what happens the moment I take a um, um, uh, digital taxi and I'm paid, I, I pay tax for it, I start looking for a taxi off the platform. And you know what that happens? Women begin getting abused offline because then there is no trail of them calling that taxi. So we still now have a black economy that you can't actually now go for because you don't understand how it actually works. I also think that we must continue to examine these unintended consequences. 
if you're talking about local manufacturing, and this I think has been in the news this past weekend, we're talking about local manufacturing and saying we don't wanna import things from abroad, including gadgets, but we don't have a free economic zone. We don't have electricity. We're not giving incentives for local startups to actually, or local companies to actually build these products. It's counter, um, you know, um, productive. At the end of the day, we're still going to have the same country that is reliant on these big tech giants. Um, and I want to say this, I think I wrote it about it on Twitter a few months ago. Um, I am a big fan of American tech products um, and European policy. I think they are great, they have their place. But the moment a country begins to favor big tech giants over their own startups, we will kill our startups. And I think the Ukraine-Russia um, war should be a lesson to us that at the end of the day, when there's war, people will rely on their own startups for them to stand up for their own country. And we've seen this with India, where India is really investing in their own local startups to ensure that there are certain products that are actually just provided by their native startups. So you should not kill your startups hoping that American companies or, or European companies will save you at the end of the day. We need to nurture our own startups in that sense. My last comment will be this, um, that we may just be taxing the same people you know, in a bid to expand the tax base, we're actually not expanding the tax base. Um, we have the Juakali sector that needs more. Um, and I want, to, I want to explain this in terms of time. We have a data protection law now, uh, which I say is like maybe 70 years late. These are the same things that Europe did in the 70s to have, you know, um, to have a data protection law. And so when they come up with certain laws like Digital Services Act, they come up with the AI Act now, their economies are ready for it because they've gone through a journey. But we just started the other day, but we want to introduce so many taxes. Our market is not mature. Our students still don't have electricity. They don't have gadgets to go to school. But the more we introduce taxing on pl of platforms, which I think we need to do away with this, like we should not tax 16% VAT on using an app. An app should be a marketplace. It should be a platform that connects you to the rest of the world because Otherwise, people will have to pay for B VPN and they, they start looking for places. I, I know several, like for example, I know several um, Nigerians who just say, you know what, I may live in Nigeria, but I can't use my ATM in Nigeria. My credit limit is $50. So they will come to Kenya and look for a work permit that allows them to actually just have a bank account in Kenya. You know, Kenya is going to do, go through the same, same thing if we don't take, um, because middle-class people are actually brilliant people. They will look for ways in which they can evade tax and what does that leave us with? It leaves you with no one, no one actually paying taxes. And then the system actually breaks down or you have a middle class that actually just rises up and says, you will not tax us this much, you know? So I just wanna say that this is not to any individual, but it's really to officers and for us to start thinking through what are the creative ways of taxation? What can we, even us as, as citizens, can we start thinking through, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we come up with new ways of, of telling the government, by the way, I think you should tax this sector. This is the sector that's actually doing this. If you, if you tax maybe betting, for example, this is what it would do. And then when we tax betting, we don't take the money and steal it. We take that money and then begin to look at issues of access because Africa does not have access. Even if you have access, we have zero, usage is really low. And I think the numbers from GSMA, um, and then you can you know, correct me on this. The numbers just show that, you know, we can say we have 5G, but people don't have devices, you know, over 65% of people who use phones in Kenya are feature phones. So they are on USSD, they, they are not on online. So if you're talking about online education, they don't have it. And I think that we need to start thinking through and saying that this digital is, it's still a calf. It's not a cow that can give us milk. So what do you do to a calf? You continue to nurture it, you give it food and then say, in seven years, our digital economy should have given us this because we have actually invested in it. But if you don't invest in it, we're not gonna reap a reward. Um, so I think Ben, you needed to say something about, about those numbers, please. Um, yeah, thanks. I had, a, I had a simple question for Karen actually, uh, but I will comment on what, what, uh, what India has said before I come to that. Uh, question to Karen. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly um, this point about uh, registering your startups in Delaware is, is an important one. And I, I'm, I'm a, a involved in a couple of startups here where I'm, I'm working with uh, young Kenyan geniuses who are setting startups up. And, you know, we've been going to, uh, to VCs, not international VCs, but VCs who are present here in Kenya. And they've been advising us uh, that this business is something that we should incorporate in Delaware from the start. 
um, you know, this is something we want to start in Kenya and scale up across uh, across Africa. And originally, a lot of um, you know Pan African companies have traditionally, you know, uh, incorporated in Mauritius. It's been seen as a, as a good environment for for uh, Pan African companies. Um, uh, but we've seen Kenyan companies set up, and we've seen them leave and go to Dubai or go to Mauritius. This is common, but it, it's got to the stage where those who are potentially going to fund your company are telling you from the outset, you know, go to uh, go to Delaware. Um, and, and to what Linda was saying about Zoom and other things, you know, certainly we have seen exactly that. We've seen that uh, as these, these 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 taxes have come, and it's, it's more the BAT than the BST. Um, um, but they have been, you know, applied directly um, on to, to Kenyans uh, and on the sales price. And it may be, and this is the thing I wanted to say, that, that the larger companies who, um, who may be doing expansive business um, in Kenya, so a company like Zoom or Netflix or, um, or, or Google, it may be the companies like that, they have some substantive revenues of their digital services they're selling in Kenya and then they can put those taxes and levies onto the sale price. But there are also companies who, uh, smaller digital companies, so maybe a thousand, hundreds of thousands of digital companies in the world, um, but some of them might not really notice Kenya um, or, or even care that much about Kenya to even go through the process. So let's say, for instance, video games, uh, a company like Steam, who do an online PC gaming platform, you know, they might see Kenya as a very small market with a few people with PC gaming. Uh, and then they might just see that Kenya's too much hassle for them. And we have seen this. There was one um, hosting company from the Netherlands who were hosting servers um, and, and doing some kind of infrastructure as a service. And they probably didn't have a very big business in Kenya, but the cost that they were going to see to uh, get this local um, uh, local agent and everything else and have tax advice, it's just, you know, it's not worth it. It's not worth the bother for them. So they just said, we'll block, we'll geo block our services in Kenya so they don't work in Kenya because it's just too much, uh, it's too much to go through for this tiny market. So we, we're plus chasing away digital services that might want to come uh, because it's, it's too much hassle. But the, the, the innocent question I had to Karen was um, you were talking about the, the local tax representatives for uh, that companies would appoint a tax representative in order to pay the, um, the DST. Um, so my question is, that, that's the same for VAT as well, yeah? It, it, you can have a problem. So it, there's the 16% VAT and the 1.5% VAT, but that same local represent, tax representative that a foreign company would appoint would pay both, yeah? If you can clarify that, that was my question. Um, Linda, I'm sure Linda, you can help me now moderate this okay. session because <laughs> you've just spoken so much passionate about this issue. Um, uh, yeah, um, yeah, take us off. Okay, well, thank you. I think Karen will go next and then um, Rene. Rene would um, proceed with their comments. I don't know, Karen, if you have an answer for Ben Roberts. Okay, maybe, maybe repeat the question. Ben. Yeah, so what I'm asking, Karen, is you talked about the tax representative, uh, the foreign companies appointing the local tax representative to pay the DST. Uh, but my question was, that same tax representative would also pay the VAT, yeah? so they would they would also remit the VAT and the DST. That, that, that's how I understood it, but I, I don't think you could clarify that for me, because I'm, that one I wasn't so sure of. Uh, yeah, thank you. So the, uh, the local representative is appointed to act on behalf of the multinationals and uh, their responsibility includes accounting for all taxes, which is VAT on the digital uh, services and also accounting for digital service tax. So yes, they would do both. Okay, thanks. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, um, Rene, um, your comments on this? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like. I'm, I'm curious about, you know, um, the, the sort of cases that are going to the tax tribunal, the kind of challenges that your clients are coming, you know, um, are facing currently with, with the issue of taxation. 
Uh, thank you, Linda. You've raised valid questions, questions I have heard from the time inception of the digital service tax, all those concerns. The question is, how are we going to get hold of the multinationals? But I've been following the discussions on the, uh, with the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, that is OECD. They are intent on roping in the multinationals by ensuring that uh, they allocate profits to countries where multinationals don't have a, a physical presence because the issue has been, uh, whereas you can be able to trace the, the small entities, the, the, the startups as you have referred to them, the multinationals are able to get away with it because you can't actually pin them down or they find the tax haven. So there's a an, an concerted effort to bring in the multinational so that then taxes, uh, they are also uh, eligible to pay taxes similar to those of other businesses. But I don't know if the Revenue Authority can consider granting reprieve to the startups for a certain period of time as is done with the commercial businesses. When you set up a commercial entity or a manufacturing entity, you normally have a window period within which you don't uh, pay taxes or, is, or even the special economic zones or the EPZs, if something like that can be introduced so that an SME has sufficient time to start business, make some profit, or at least be stable before they start paying these taxes, then it would be very encouraging uh, for the startups to come up. There's also a proposal that in future, they would then have a flat tax of 15% to be charged you know, on any entity that is providing any digital service such that let's say if Kenya, for example, is only charging the 1.5%, what happens then to the difference? The difference then you'd have to pay it in your country so that at the end of the day, a multinational does not get away with it and the smaller entities do not suffer the consequences. So I think if we push this conversation further, we should be able to, to get a positive result where there's equity and equality uh, on uh, charging of taxation. Uh, with regard to cases, as I had indicated in my opening remarks, as at now, we have not seen any assessments. It's too early. Uh, I'm sure maybe in the next three or four years, when now the audits are being undertaken by KRA to confirm if indeed the correct returns are being filed, then we'll be able to see uh, what issues are arising by way of assessment or by way of compliance. So as at now, it is a bit early for me to give a feedback on that, but I believe in the next two or three years, we may be able to see a, a proliferation of cases on our DST matters. Okay, thank you so much, Rene, for that. Um, I would want to give the floor to, um, you know, any attendee who would like to, if you're a participant and would like to make a comment, please raise your hand and our media team will, uh, will you know, um, allow you to speak. Um, I think as we do that, I'm just going to see some of the comments. Erica says, tax holidays aren't a solution to bad tax policy. Um, and Joyce Kibet says, I suggest Kerry should adopt innovative practices such as tax hackathons, crowdsourcing for tax solutions, ETC, as a way of being creative with the tax policies. Um, and then we also have um, um, Christine saying, Christine, we're hoping that the offices involved will do better with regards to services available digitally. Um, and um, we have uh, Margaret who asked, why is Kerry not going for the big boys who evade taxes? Um, you know, we need a bit of data. It should be data-driven decision-making in expanding the tax collection bracket. And maybe that's where the tax ecosystem, we really haven't um, done the, the digital ecosystem. We haven't done much to provide the numbers. You know, how is this tax affecting our businesses? Who's moved where? Um, I think we also need to provide that, that um, those numbers to ensure that um, we actually are data-driven as well to inform, inform this. I don't know if we have um, if people who have a question or a comment, um, please. Um, I am so many kilometers away from the media team, so I'm not able to know. Yes. So we there have some two hands. Okay, let's proceed. Um, there were two hands um, that were up. We're just saying yeah. that the KRA is here, but they will not catch you, so <laughs> don't be afraid <laughs> to talk. Okay, Erica, <laughs> I think Erica is, in, is on point. Yes, Erica. Hi, Linda. I hope you can hear me okay. Yes, we can hear you. Proceed. Lovely. Uh, you had great points. Um, I just wanted to, as a non-resident Kenyan taxpayer, <laughs> um, give some context to, again, uh, how tax evolved, not just in Kenya, but in African states in general. 
um, we saw a rapid development of almost identical tax statutes come about within the last 10 to 15 years. And that initiative was largely powered by the International Center for Tax and Development, uh, which was funded primarily by the UK, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the Norwegian Agency for Cooperation. And they essentially went to all of the African Union member states and said, you're not poor because of colonization. You're poor because you don't tax your citizens. And so we saw the evolution sort of from that place of our modern tax schemes that we're seeing in places like Kenya, which leads us to the digital tax. And I do want to uh, support some of your comments if we, we keep saying that people are evading taxes, that there's capital flight, all of these terminologies came from the ICTD. There isn't Kenyans or other investors, small and medium enterprise owners who are evading taxation. There are big multinational corporations from the West that are doing that. And so when we build our tax policy, uh, from a perspective of trying to capture revenue from Western multinationals, rather than trying to find a fair tax policy for small and medium enterprise owners, we end up with bad policy, like the digital services tax, that's mostly impacting domestic taxpayers and folks who want to invest, folks, folks who actually want to come and live in the country. And speaking from the point of view of Afro-descendant investors, in other words, Black Canadians, Black Americans, Black Caribbean, Black Brazilians, all of these Black folks who would love to come and invest in your country. I had two people this week that I had to advise who were asking me about Kenya. I said, go to Namibia, go to Mauritius. You can't go to Kenya. Kenya will tax you until you go out of business. So I think thinking about the fact that Kenya does not have a double taxation agreement with many countries in which its investment class might be coming from, that Kenya does not have a double taxation agreement with uh, the United States, uh, Mauritius does, um, that Kenya taxes on all foreign income. So if you have a diaspora, or a greater um, Afro-descendant diaspora, meaning the, the descendants of slaves who are um, middle-income people who are saying, hey, I'd love to go to Kenya and open up a small manufacturing operation, or I'd love to go to Kenya and open up my digital services uh, business. They can't come to Kenya because what they would normally do is work their job in the United States remotely. Well, Kenya would tax them on their foreign uh, employment income and then require them to pay almost $100,000 just to incorporate their licensure in order to have a corporate entity and then tax them on their digital services, 1% one, um, 1 of all their digital services. So after you do that to an Afro descendant or African diaspora investor, what's left, they're out of business. So I think we need to talk about tax policy in the context of continued neocolonization. We need to talk about the fact that a lot of our ideas are coming from people who have absolutely no interest in the African continent or its diasporas and who are intent, intent and intentional on ensuring that Afro-descendant investors and other diaspora investors don't return. They're not interested in you having a good GDP. They're not interested in you having a good, healthy middle class. They're interested in being able to take your resources and relocate them and take, as Linda said, your best and brightest to brain drain you. And they do that by guiding and encouraging your tax policy. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you so much, Erica. You've actually um, just given me uh, more, uh, more news on how our government is really taxing us and not really considering um, the small and medium-sized companies. Um, uh, before somebody else, I can see Angela and Dolo. Yes, Angela, talk to us. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good afternoon to you. Now, my comment is due to the KRA speaker. 
maybe you can have a proper tax policy because we cannot be amending the finance act every year mm. and giving changes to taxes without giving the taxpayer an opportunity to adjust the new taxes and uh, i think the culture that you have developed that uh, we just wake up and uh, identify a sector and see oh that sector is doing well let's overtax that sector i think uh, we should come up with a proper tax policy for us to be able to collect revenue in a way that would kill the small businesses and startup companies that is my comment okay um there is also joan hi uh, good afternoon hi. everyone yes uh thank you for this uh thank you for this um meeting that you've set up together my issue um i think i've made an, a couple of comments and also questions on the chat i don't know who will address it but it would be important to address it. that thank you but i actually wanted to also add my voice to to what i, I don't remember that before the before the, the speaker who spoke now, there was a lady who was talking about double taxation. I think very key to the digital economy or taxation of the digital economy will be the issue around double taxation. And putting an em emphasis on countries, I mean, a country like Kenya to negotiate, uh, to negotiate uh, double taxation treaties, with, um, with a number of, of like business partners or a number of countries that they, they, they're in business with becomes very crucial and very key. And then the negotiations have to be from an informed perspective. Now, let me just give an example of, um, an example of like, there's no, much as we have the East African, uh, the East African model of the double taxation agreement, we don't have countries within the East African community, apart from I think Rwanda and I think Kenya recently also uh, became, recently I think they, they um, what is that word? Uh, sorry, the word just went, but like you have very few countries that have signed to it, then what are we doing in light of the, uh, in light of uh, now taxation at this level, when we don't even have uh, double taxation treaties within, uh, among, amongst ourselves and maybe even with our business partners. So it's very crucial that issues of double taxation is looked at, it's very crucial that also the tax administration develops uh, like ways they will deal with this because right now the landscape, everything is changing and the digital economy is everything right now. The traditional, the, the traditional method, methods are now somehow being watered down though we still have them. And, and then I liked what Linda talked about. Linda talked about, you know, overtaxing even startups and small, small companies, you're running people out. So I think these are conversations we should continue having. They are, we should push on with a number of things, including the policies and probably see how to tap into the digital uh, economy, the taxation of the digital economy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joanne. We appreciate your comments. And um, I don't know if Karin would want to make a comment. I think your hand was up at some point. Um, there's been questions that were raised that I think were so important on double taxation treaties, even within East Africa, um, looking at how we are treating, you know, um, our partners and, you know, really thinking through whether tax is a tool of neocolonialism, where we are still you know, um, really following and, and making sure that the, our best and brightest, you know, leave, leave the continent. Um, I would want to, you know, um, just I think conclude this by having, uh, you know, our panelists get to, you know, give us the comments. I think I'll start from, um, from Karen. Um, what, what would be your answers be um, in this sense? Is Kerry open towards, you know, some multi-stakeholderism? We've seen this with internet governance where, you know, um, the, the approach now is to ensure um, that every single day, as you come up with policies that affect the internet, that you have everyone on board. You have government, you have private sector, you know, you have civil society come up and be able to, um, you know, to be part of policy making processes. So I think we'll start with you, um, Karen, on your responses. And I think um, um, last comments on this. Yeah, thank you. 
Uh, Linda, I, I think one of the things I've, uh, I've picked uh, from the conversation is the issue of uh, the startups uh, looking for support from the government to just ensure, you know, they are able to progress with the minimal, uh, you know, minimal taxes to allow for growth. So first of all, I would say that uh, uh, when you looked at uh, what Rene said, uh, initially the digital service tax was introduced applying to both local and, uh, you know, non-residents and resident companies. But the government realized that we need to support our startups. And uh, uh, actually the law was amended and uh, currently digital service tax does not apply to resident companies. So this was done with a view of supporting the startups uh, because there was hue and cry that, uh, you know, we need to support our young innovators so that uh, if somebody comes up with, uh, with let's say, an app locally, then, uh, you know, they don't need to pay the digital taxes. So currently the law was changed to just take into consideration uh, that kind of support to the young innovators. And uh, just to bring on board, uh, you know, young people innovating. I, I saw online that somebody talked of KRA should think of hackathons. Just last week, uh, we had one at Strathmore University where we, uh, we were encouraging young students, you know, to come up with the various uh, solutions for tax issues. And uh, this was really, uh, the participation was, uh, was, really, was really good. We had young people from universities, young uh, tax pra practitioners who could come up with uh, various solutions. And so we can encourage that, uh, maybe uh, look at what we have. We do have the Kenya School of Revenue Administration that runs such kind of program. Once in a while, you can check on the website of the KRA, it's called KESRA, KRA Revenue uh, School of Administration, sorry. Uh, they do run programs that are aimed at, uh, you know, take, uh, looking at uh, innovative ways of uh, solutions to our tax issues. And uh, another thing I wanted to talk about is... Uh, double tax agreements. Uh, this is an ongoing uh, process. Uh, every country uh, through the treasury, that is the national treasury, do have negotiations for uh, tax treaties. And uh, when people bring up uh, proposals on what can favor them in terms of taxes, then this can be considered. So sometimes you find some countries uh, are willing to, you know, to negotiate for their citizens so that they get a lower tax treatment when it comes to them dealing with cross-border uh, trade. So what I can urge is that uh, we need to also push our governments if we are in uh, another country, just so that these negotiations can go on. But I can say currently Kenya has a uh, double tax treaty with more than 20 countries. And uh, this is... Uh, it's negotiation that is ongoing and uh, Kenya can always bring on board additional countries so that uh, people can enjoy preferential tax treatment when it comes to the, you know, the taxation rates, especially we have uh, uh, those who are, let's, let's say, doing consultancy, you find you are uh, based in maybe America and you come to Kenya. Uh, we find that uh, UK, we do have a ta double tax treatment. So, uh, it depends on the country, how they can push for their citizens and also engage with the local national treasury so that this can be, you know, taken uh, into consideration uh, for the benefit of the citizens. And one thing I have observed is that uh, we have a traditional way of uh, you know, a one tax policy that has been applied in many years for the uh, EPZ, that is export processing zones, which mainly was meant for manufacturers. But I can uh, encourage that our local innovators to, to push for inclusion of, uh, you know, economic zones where also provision of, uh, you know, uh, IT services will be included as part of, uh, you know, in the EPZ zones. We could have like uh, the Konza Techno City, 
where if we operate from within there, it becomes an economic zone uh, where, you know, people can get preferential tax treatments. We do have EPZs that operate in Kenya for like 10 years and, they, you know, they have a tax holiday, no corporation tax at all. So we can push for such kind of uh, policy as the innovators to operate within a specific uh, economic zone uh, where we can enjoy such uh, preferential tax uh, tax uh, tax uh, tax rates. Currently, it's not existing, but uh, I believe this is a conversation that can you know the government can listen to this. And during the budget making, we do have groups of uh, people in the economy. You can put yourself in a group and just you know approach the budget team, present your case, and. Uh, Yes, the government is ready to support the young innovators just to ensure that our economy can create jobs and opportunities locally yeah, because employment creation is one of the agenda of the government. So if we push for that, then uh, with low preferential tax rates, yes, there'll be more opportunities and we will be seeing a lot of taxes indirectly created by, by, by such, a, such, a, such a innovators. I think that's what I can say. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Karen. And I would want to, um, I think just echo what you said about, um, that's a really great idea. We should have had maybe a member of parliament on the call and see ways in which we could involve parliament in coming up with new policies. I like the idea about a special economic zone um, for IT. Um, and I think we could um, pursue that, that as an idea. Um, also too, I think you mentioned the, the double taxation treaties. Um, some of you know, I am on a serious hunt for a Japanese boyfriend because the Jap Japanese passport is the strongest passport in the world. And now number two, I've been seeing the, I think the case, the litigation now that's been happening with the Japanese uh, that have been given preferential treatment in terms of tax in Kenya. And so if you're a Japanese and you're watching, I really need your passport in my life. So we'll, we'll go to, um, I think there's one important, Crucial question in two minutes, um, maybe even less. Um, Karen, how do we comply? Because there are many startups here that are asking the question around compliance. How do we comply with all this, um, um, all, 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 all this demand around taxation? Um, what do you suggest quickly for startups that can't afford a full-time accountant or carry personnel before the audit starts? And I think from there we'll segue into Rene around limiting, you know, liability. Karen, can you hear us? No, okay. I, I think we'll go to Rene um, as we close. Don't worry, we'll still close at 3.30, um, at, um, at 4.30. So um, Rene, how do we limit liability? Uh, thank you, Linda. Limiting liability means trying to ensure that you are in compliance. As I had stated, the law has since been amended. So what would really apply to the SMEs uh, would be the local taxes, that is the income tax, corporation tax, just ensure that you file your returns on time. And if it is not very clear, we are available to provide one of services where we can be able to guide you through uh, the compliance uh, processes. So you don't have to have a full-time accountant on board. You can always bring in somebody for a specific purpose to assist you. Uh, but touching on the double taxation agreements, there are several that have been signed, including with Mauritius. And you find that whereas Mauritius has already deposited the instruments as required, Kenya is still holding back. So you find it's more of a political issue uh, or negotiation that is still going on. They feel there are quite a number of companies that have registered in Mauritius. And uh, if they enjoy this, uh, the double taxation agreements, then they lose out on taxes. So it's, it's such a del difficult, uh, delicate balancing act. We've really tried to dis have dis discussions on how we can expedite and have all the signed uh, double taxation agreements uh, uh, affected or coming into force. Uh, we also have the national tax policy, which is currently ad undergoing discussion and debate uh, through Kenya Association of Manufacturers, where we are a member, we have been able to make presentations. And indeed, it has been a matter of concern where we are constantly having amendments to the tax laws causes a lot of confusion and disorganization uh, to businesses. So I hope once this national tax policy is implemented, there would be a, a grace period of let's say five years before the laws, the tax laws are actually amended unless it's extremely uh, necessary. So for me, that would be my, my parting shot. 
compliance is, is easy. Just reach out to we, the professionals. We can be able to assist you. Sometimes we even provide pro bono services, depending on the kind of, of entity that you have, like a charitable entity. We have been able to assist some to gain compliance. So just get the right professionals on board and you'll be guided accordingly. Thank you. Excellent. Um, thank you so much, Rene. I don't know if Karen, you would you wanted to make the, that last comment before we close off with uh, Ben Roberts. Um, yes, Karen, in terms of compliance, thank you. I think my last comment is uh, just to encourage the innovators to look into uh, understand tax uh, matters. Uh, get somebody, if you are not very good in tax, get somebody to work with you uh, because when you start up your company and you do not understand uh, some tax issues, then at a later date, then you get to have issues with the tax authority. So I, I would urge that you consider tax planning as part of, uh, uh, you know, just a priority as you establish your, you know, your companies and then to walk along with somebody who can make you understand, uh, you know, tax issues. Otherwise, uh, the government is is ready to engage with uh, various groups for purposes of, uh, you know, uh, changing the laws that uh, can work for both the, uh, the, the citizens and also both for the government. Because if people feel that taxes are punitive, then we end up having some kind of black market, as Linda said. And then uh, in the end, the government lose this kind of taxes. So what I would urge is that, uh, uh, let your groups be seen. Let your let let if you are innovators, form groups, yeah, and come and uh, engage with the government. And uh, Kiari do have stakeholder engagements where you can present your issues, and we have people who can listen to you and pick up a few things that can be made into you know policies can be changed to favor both both uh, both the government and the business uh, community. So that's what I I can say. Thank you. Excellent. Um, thank you very much for, for that comment. I think we'll I'll, I'll finally just have um, Ben Roberts um, make a comment and then I'll hand over to my colleagues back at the Lawyers Hub with Silas. Um, I think this, this was a very interesting discussion. Um, ben, you lead the, um, the ICT subsector. Sorry, I forget the name. I haven't slept. <laughs> so yeah. uh, at Kepta, which um, I'm seeing questions on the chat around how do we join this ad policy advocacy groups? Um, and I'd say this, Lawyers Hub does policy and we engage on all these issues. Every single Monday, we are discussing different topics that affect the ICT ecosystem. Um, but we're also members of KEPSA um, and KEPSA has been doing a really great job in engaging um, policymakers. And so I would urge you as well to, you know, um, join KEPSA, um, the voice of the um, Kenya private sector um, that you will be able to engage. So um, Ben, your final remarks and your wrap up. Yeah, thanks. Let, let, me, let me plug that first. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm chair of the ICT sector board in in Kenya Private Sector Alliance KEPSA, and and generally that sector board um, we are uh, some of us are people from the industry. I'm one of those, but we also have a number of uh, tech lawyers and people who are interested in, uh, in 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 this area of policy. And obviously, lawyers have a, one of our most active uh, members in the sector. And this is how come I uh, I do so much work with uh, Linda and the Lawyers Tech Hub. So it's great to bring these conversations together. Um, I think um, I think we're having a, a, a disjoinder here between perception and reality, right? Um, and um, it, it's not okay uh, for government to measure its performance in likes and shares, right? Government's performance is measured on economic prosperity and other things and growth in the economy. And, and this is how this government is, is setting out to, to want to be. It's got a clear economic agenda which is being driven from, um, you know, one of the pillars is being this, the digital superhighway and the digital economy, which is one of the leading pillars of, of this new government. And they're taking it seriously. Um, but let's say, I'd say this perception and reality. Um, we can talk of digital services tax and, and VAT. Uh, we can say there's a perception that we're taxing big tech giants who are making profits in Kenya and not paying their fair share. Reality is, that we're just passing costs on to Kenyans. Um, I posted in the chat, I posted an article, uh, you know, it was Google putting up its, its costs in Kenya by 16%. This is uh, taxes being passed straight on to Kenyans. And yes, 
much as VAT if it's being used by a company uh, that that'll be uh, reclaimed and charged on in the services, but becomes part of your cost of sales. If your cloud costs to run your digital services, you need Google or Microsoft, you have to pay those costs. It becomes part of your cost of sales and you're on which charge that digital service to, to your customers, the Kenyans. So this isn't a tax on big tech, this is a tax on Kenyans. Huh? Uh, and this is a tax on the youth because it's the youth who want to get into gadgets and get into these digital services. So we've got overtaxation of gadgets, overtaxation on, on digital services. Um, that's point number one. Number two, um, you know, we're seeing now, uh, although we've made great strides in Kenya, and we're 15 years ahead of all of our neighbors in, in Africa, uh, all of our immediate neighbors were 15 years ahead in terms of digital development here. We've done great things with private sector and government, building subsea cables and data centers and, and all of these things. Um, this government wants to do more. Um, and the government set a clear agenda to build 100,000 kilometers of fiber. Um, and you'll see where is the money coming from to, to build this 100,000 kilometers of fiber. You'll see um, a lot of uh, development finance is, is queuing up to come. Where, you know, the world sees the potential um, of Kenya as being a digital nation uh, because it's leading in ahead. Uh, but you're seeing a lot of pressure coming from, and there are articles about the IMF and the World Bank and others, putting pressure on Kenya about these digital taxes, saying that these digital, these digital taxes have to be done away with. Why? Because Kenya is looking out to international development finance, to come and build infrastructure uh, to get people connected and get people broadband. Yet, 20% of all broadband duties or broadband um, um, you know, costs are going into excise tax. Uh, plus another 16% on top, 39.2 uh, is going into taxes. So um, whilst Kenya is on one hand, you know, looking to international markets for development finance to come and build its digital economy, it's also then saying, ah, but we'll take 40% of that in tax if it's broadband. We'll take uh, 17, 18% of this if it's digital services. We'll take 60% of its gadgets. And, and beggars can't be choosers. Um, this is why the pressure is coming on from these IMF, World Bank, et cetera, uh, to, to reduce some of these taxes in line with the policies that have been set by, um, by Kenya and, and its you know, uh, Ministry of ICT. Um, Kenya is very good at, at making policies. Uh, we seem to have a trouble implementing them. Uh, and, and I, but I do think, I, I do see hope uh, at the end of the tunnel. I see, I see this government uh, having some cohesion. I see, I see uh, cohesion between Coming from the top, coming from His Excellency the President, I'm seeing cohesion between ministries. I'm seeing cohesion between uh, the legislative arm of government and and the executive. So um, I'm hoping for for better things to come. I'm hoping for uh, policies that uh, policies that are implemented into legislation and not um, not some randomness where we say one thing and do the other. So I'm hopeful about the future, Linda. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm hopeful for digital economy, and I'm hopeful that uh, taxation will get it right. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I would just say this tax should never be used as a tool of oppression. Um, startups should be proud enough to announce when they raise money uh, because Kenyan startups are raising so much money, but they're not announcing because they know that somebody's going to come for them. Um, we're buying new phones and we can't show them. Um, we are leading nice lives, but we can't put it on Instagram um, because you know that it will be used as a tool of oppression. I think we should be proud enough that we purchase these things, but we're also proud enough that we are taxpayers, that we paid this tax because that tax was not punitive or it was never used as a tool to, to oppress you. Um, and so um, I think I, I just want to hand back to my colleagues who've done such an amazing job putting this event together. Together. Uh, Silas, back to you in studio. I've always wanted Thank to Thank you. I can see one of um, our attendees saying, preach, Linda, preach. Yes, don't use tax as a tool for oppression. Thank you so much. Um, we've talked about um, double taxation. We've talked about the digital economy. And um, we've talked about so much. And I remember even reading an article in the morning about um, how it was not in the morning, it was like two weeks ago about how the IMF and um, the other international companies really pushing Kenya to remove the digital service tax altogether. And um, just talking about double taxation, um, our topic, our, our theme for this year's Africa Low Tech Festival is on digital trade. And I'm sure we are 
this is part of the call for abstract that we are doing. So someone can <laughs> make a topic out of this. So kindly, we are having uh, uh, the call for abstracts and call for session proposals for the Africa Low Tech Festival 2023. It's coming in July 11th and 12th. So kindly uh, head on to our social media platforms. Uh, we're actually making those proposals, um, uh, uh, the calls out. So make sure you get your chance to actually make a, a, a a proposal or an abstract. And I want to thank our panelists, um, Renee. I want to thank uh, Ben Roberts. I want to thank Karen. I also want to thank you, Linda, for coming in very strongly and also helping me moderate this session. And um, uh, after this, you can also follow up these discussions. It's, it has been live uh, on Facebook and YouTube, also on Twitter. Yes. So if feel free to share it to your friends. And also, if you have any other opinion that we didn't really mention, you can tag us on our social media platforms, as I had mentioned, uh, Facebook at Lawyer Sub Kenya, and most of them at Lawyer Sub Kenya, when you look at it, you'll find us. Make that topic um, known. And please, I want to see you all at the African Low Tech Festival 2023. So I'd want to finish off there and see you next week, Monday, same time, same place. We'll be having another topic. So I'd want to see you all. So uh, have a lovely evening. Thank you.